Last year, I made a video about why I choose to record with a digital Porta Studio instead of using a computer and a DAW. But the truth is that that perspective doesn't make sense in the broader context of recording history. A digital Porta Studio has a lot more features and power than would have been available on earlier devices that people use to record things from their homes. As a point of contrast, let's look at two primitive methods of home recording that use technology that predates the earliest Porta Studios that rolled out in the late 70s, early 80s. Method number one, the play school method. This is the simplest form of home recording that I know of. All it requires is that you have a consumer grade tape player with a record function. The play school method, as I'm calling it, goes something like this. I know I want. And the results sound like this. I'm fond of this method and sound because it's what I used to make my very first recordings. Except instead of this little Panasonic thing, I had a play school toy tape player, hence the name play school method. There's beauty in the simplicity of this approach, but there are a few caveats. First, I love this sound, but not everybody's gonna love the sound. Second, you have very few controls. And third, with one device like this, you can't do any overdubs. It's fine, I guess, for capturing the sound of something live happening in the room, but if you're a one-man band like me, it's simply impossible to use this device to perform layers of overdubs. Unless... You can find a second consumer-grade tape player slash recorder. Using two of these together, you can record overdubs, as many overdubs as you like, using what I call the Daniel Johnston method. Step one, get your first tape player, put a tape in it, and record the first of your layers. Then you have to rewind this tape to the point where you started recording. Next, you have to set up your second unit to record. That means not only do you need the unit, and in this case, a power cord, but you also need a second tape. Okay, then you have to arrange your two devices, and here's the point. I'm gonna be using this device to record, and the microphone is right there, it says mic, and then I'm gonna be using this device to play back the guitar part that I already recorded. It's gonna emit from this speaker, and I hope get captured by that speaker, and at the same time, I'm back here, hello, and I'm gonna sing the overdub of my vocal. So you set up your second unit to record both the playback from tape deck one and the live performance onto a single tape. And then when you rewind, I'm not gonna make you listen to a rewind. You'll be able to hear both of them together. That is the sound of an overdub. As I mentioned before, I call it the Daniel Johnston method because DIY legend Daniel Johnston is reported to have recorded some of his classic stuff using exactly this approach. Two consumer grade cassette players that he would record different items onto and bounce back and forth between to create like a simulation of multi-track recording. So you get overdubs. Yay! But there are still drawbacks to the Dan Johnston method. The first might seem obvious, but it's kind of difficult to control the levels of the two sources that you're recording, i.e. the playback and the live performance. The only way you know if you've got it right is when you rewind and listen again on playback. The second major drawback of the Dan Johnson method is that every overdub that you perform adds a layer of smear onto your sound. Now by smear, what I mean are changes that are affected by a few different stages in the process of recording and playing back with one of these devices. First, at the microphone stage. Every microphone has its own EQ character and this microphone is gonna apply its character. Bear in mind, this wasn't designed to record music, so it's not really gonna reproduce the sound in the room quite the way you might expect. In addition, I understand that most of these, because of the original design purpose as a consumer grade like recording device for dictation or, you know, like ordinary non-musical applications, I'm pretty sure these all have built-in compressors that you can't control. So you've got inbound EQ and inbound compression, both of which out of your control. Then at stage two, you're recording to tape. I'm not gonna wax poetic about tape sound, but if you're recording with a cheap cassette tape like I am on a cheap cassette player like I am, you're gonna get about as much 
tape mojo as a person can possibly get. All the hiss, all the warble, there's no Dolby on this. And the last stage is, uh, we didn't use this one, but for example, is to do the overdub, you're playing back a portion of your recorded sound through a little speaker that's behind this grill. A speaker, like a microphone, has its own EQ character, so there's that factor. Um, also not designed to reproduce music, as I mentioned before. And um, I've tried a few of these, and every single one makes a mechanical sound as you use it. A sound that's not coming from the speaker, it's coming from the apparatus. That's something you're going to be picking up with the microphone on your second tape recorder. Those are the most obvious drawbacks to this approach, and, and to be honest with you, whether they're drawbacks is really a matter of personal taste. So, what do you think about the Dan Johnson method, about the play school method, about the sounds that they were able to capture and recreate? I'm going to put links to both of the tracks that I recorded in the description so you can go back and listen for yourself. I'd love to know which one you think sounds better than the other. And if you think they both suck, tell me that too. I think the most divisive thing about both of these primitive recording methods is probably the smear, that smeared out sound. I love the sound for a few reasons. First, nostalgic reasons, see earlier in the video. Second, I kind of like the thick molasses -y sound that it creates. Sometimes when I do recordings in a Porta Studio or other digital context, I don't want to start throwing around buzzwords, but it can start to feel a little bit sterile. That's probably because I don't know what I'm doing, really. I'm not an expert at using compression or EQ or other features that might be available to me in something that's more complex than one of these. This does all that for me and ends up creating something that never sounds thin. It never sounds wimpy. It always sounds about as full and powerful and mysterious as I remember music sounding when I was a kid. For me personally, I like the fact that the smear covers up a lot of mistakes. Not only does that mean that I can record things a little bit more quickly and with more gusto, but I'm really self-conscious about my voice and sometimes it's hard for me to coax a really energetic performance because I'm worried about what if it cracks up in this spot or if I don't quite hit this note. The smear kind of washes out a lot of those details in a way that at least as a performer in real time I think you know, I'm just going to go for it. I'm sure it's going to turn out fine. And the result is that I feel like I get more energetic performances out of myself when I use a method like one of these, Play School or Dan Johnston. But that's just me. So in the comments, let me know how you feel about both of these methods, if you prefer one or the other. And like I said, if you, if you hate them both, that, that's fine too. And that's it. If you liked this, click like. Subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. I've already made a few suggestions about what to say in the comments, but in the comments, if you like this and content about like DIY or lo-fi recording, dollless stuff, I'd love to do more videos about that because it interests me. And if it interests you, I've got another incentive to work on those. Oh, and, and if you haven't already, and if you have a tolerance for a little bit of tape hiss and some imperfections, I highly recommend you go check out Daniel Johnston's music. He's, I guess, like a legend in the DIY kind of lo-fi community. Uh, for a variety of reasons. He had some famous fans like Kurt Cobain. He's got a long, well-documented history of mental illness, but he also wrote some really captivating, fascinating songs, songs that are near and dear to me. And he's famous for the way that he recorded. He's kind of got a sound that, for better or for worse, isn't really like anybody else. If you're interested, I recommend you go check out his album, Yip Jump Music, or Hi, How Are You? I, I prefer the former, or really... Now scrap that. You should always start with a good compilation. Just go listen to Welcome to My World, and if you like what you hear there, dig deeper. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're doing well, and I'll see you next time.